Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of uh, our conversations between Caleb Morpin and Hopal Bra. And today we are going to be talking about fascism. Uh, it's a word which is thrown around all the time um, in such a way that it, it, it's almost kind of lost its meaning for us. Um, and we don't understand where the real threat of fascism might be coming from because we're constantly being pointed to all kinds of bogey and it's look at fascism, look at fascism, look at fascism. And quite often it's just an insult that people throw at people that they don't like very much. So we want to get back to what fascism really is, uh, where the danger comes from, why it's an issue, and how we oppose it. So I'm going to start by asking Hapal, if I may, um, to define fascism for us. Famously, it was uh, Georgi Dimitrov, uh, the Bulgarian communist, who defined fascism during the interwar period uh, as a, a work he was given by the Comintern, the Third International. So, Hapal. Well, fascism is basically the most extreme form of the terroristic type of dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. A lot of people consider as though fascism is very different from parliamentary democracy, that it cannot come to countries with parliamentary democracy. Fascism, far from being very different, is actually a continuation of the same. Its progenitor is imperialism. It's not something which, is, which can be se separ separate, separated from it at a certain stage in its total decay and decadence and stagnation, imperialism, not being left with any other option, resorts to open terroristic dictatorship, resorts to open violence, when all other methods of deception and parliamentary democracy and rule of law and uh, uh, human rights fail, then in the end, this is the weapon that the bourgeoisie adopts. It is something which not only when it comes to power, it represents not only the triumph of the bourgeoisie momentarily and the weakness of the working class, but it at the same time shows the weakness of the bourgeoisie that it can no longer continue to rule by the old methods of, of this deception and has got to resort to this particular method. That is precisely why we perhaps will discuss later on why has there been no fascism in Britain and the United, United States. These are the two countries of Anglo-Saxon liberty. We can, we can discuss that uh, because of the specific historical con conditions. Uh, and it's wrong to believe that to be a fascist, you've got to be a German. Or to be a Hitlerite, you've got to have this funny moustache that Hitler wore. Nothing of the kind. It's, it's capitalism that produces it. And therefore, when people ask you not to upset the bourgeoisie, just in case it introduces capitalism, you must not oppose its, its methods because uh, it, it will resort to fascism. That's a permanent way of keeping the working class in subjection and servile to the dictates of cap capitalism. And we have to say, no, this advice is, is, is not accepted. Accept, acceptable to us. And th this, this is what the bourgeoisie does all the time. I have lived too long not to remember these lessons. We were told all the time, don't oppose social democracy because it will side with the bourgeoisie and we'll have fascism. No, it's been siding with the bourgeoisie ever since the First World War, if, if, if not earlier. And the First World War proved irrevocably that the so, that social democracy is on the side of the bourgeoisie and at every step, step it will thwart and obstruct the working class movement for socialism and join the, join the other side. I think for that for the moment is enough. We can talk about it later. Thanks, uh, Rapala. I just want to ask Caleb about this, you know, what's the essence of fascism? Because um, we associate it with extreme xenophobia. Um, and, you know, do you think you could talk a bit about what's, what's the reason for that? Well, you know, I actually would like to thank your organization because it's because of your organization. I think because of the Stalin Society of the United Kingdom uh, that I came across probably the best book I've ever read on fascism, which is Fascism and Social Revolution by R. Palm Dutt. Uh, and I think I first came across that on the website of the Stalin Society. 
Uh, I think that's where I first came across it. And that book, I think, next to Dimitrov's, you know, United Front Against Fascism, that book written by a leader of the British Communist Party in 1934 uh, really gets to the essence of fascism, which is economic. It is when capitalism is breaking down in a long term crisis of overproduction in order to try and stabilize the economy. Uh, the bourgeoisie mobilizes mass destruction, uh, destruction of productive forces, the creation of a slave labor underclass, the suppression of any faction among the ruling class that resists their drive toward destruction. And the essence of fascism is economic degrowth. Um, and that that really, I mean, when the Nazis, what they did in Nazi Germany was they created a slave labor underclass. They crushed the labor movement. They militarized the economy. Uh, they created the first prison industrial complex with the concentration camp system. Uh, they created the, the first military industrial complex by, you know, rebooting their economy with military spending and ripping apart the Versailles Treaty. They heavily suppressed all the factions of the ruling class that weren't going to go along with it. The essence of fascism is saving capitalism from an economic crisis uh, with heavy handed state repression and it's Bonapartism, one faction in the ruling class uh, taking control of the state and using the state to have a heavy handedly stabilize the economy. Um, and that understanding that I got from Dutt, um, you know, and that understanding that social democracy and fascism are really just kind of two sides of the same coin. They really kind of want to do the same thing. It's just one says it a little bit nicer and, and uses a little bit nicer, softer language, and the other uses very heavy handed, violent methods to do the same thing. But they're both, in essence, an attempt to save capitalism from a long term crisis of overproduction. Uh, that understanding is, is really, really important. Um, you know, the way I, I have I've come to learn things is that among among, you know, kind of uh, people who call themselves Marxists or communists, you generally get three definitions of fascism. Uh, the standard definition, which is the one that's the most common, right, is that fascism uh, is just uh, conservatives or Republicans or right wingers or, you know, Tories. And that if they get more authoritarian and if they get more powerful, well, then they're becoming fascist. And that's why we always have to vote for the Democrats or we always have to vote labor because, you know, if not, the conservatives are just going to become fascist. Well, our Palm Dutt and Dimitrov and others point out that there's plenty of conservative right wing authoritarian governments that aren't fascist. So that's just not not correct. Um, then you have the Trotskyites and the Trotskyites say that fascism is a mass movement of the middle class uh, that is against big capital, but also against the working class. Um, you know, and it's it's then utilized by the, the bourgeoisie uh, to stay in power at a time of crisis. Well, there's an element of truth in that. But the, the essence of fascism is not a middle class movement. I mean, they might use middle class demagogues, but it serves big capital. So that that's not really correct. And then you have kind of an ultra left definition of fascism, which now I see this one a lot, you know, as well. And it's it's the, you know, they argue that fascism is anything, you know, if somebody sounds like a communist, but they're not, they're a fascist. Right. And I get I see this one a lot. Right. That, you know, someone sounds sounds like a communist, but they're they're not pure in some way. Right. You know, if I don't think DPRK is genuinely communist, I say it's fascist. If I don't think this political group, you know, if they don't agree with me on this, but they sound like communists, well, then they must be fascists. Well, all of these definitions have an element of truth in them. Fascism is authoritarian. It is, you know, in essence, right wing because it's trying to roll back the wheels of history. Fascism does mobilize middle class elements and build kind of a demagogic movement that is against the working class and sometimes talks against the ruling class. Fascism, you know, it does attempt to to kind of mimic the planned economy that socialism and, and communism creates, but it's very anti-communist, but it's, it's still capitalism. So there's an element of truth in all of those definitions, but none of them get to the essence of it, which is that it is the breakdown of capitalism amid an economic crisis. And it is an attempt to stabilize capitalism with heavy handed repression and degrowth. And that, you know, xenophobia, right? That was your question about xenophobia. Is that part of it? Uh, I mean, it could be. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. I, I would argue that fascism can take on different forms in different places, right? That the essence of fascism is heavy handed state repression to stabilize capitalism, the breakdown and the destruction of the open liberal democratic system moving toward a heavy handed state to stabilize capitalism. And sure, demonizing immigrant workers, uh, making immigrant workers into a slave labor underclass, uh, you know, mobilizing 
you know, you know, workers against the immigrant community in order to, to set the stage. That could be part of it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be part of it. Uh, one could see a fascist movement that did the opposite. So, you know, the essence of it, I would argue, is is that economic component. And I really want to thank your organization for making Dutt's work available. And I, I you know, Peter Coffin, uh, the, the filmmaker, I mean, he he discovered Dutt and he began circulating it. There's other people. I mean, Dutt's work, uh, that book you know, fascism and social revolution is so important to my political understanding now. So thank you for making it available and, and promoting it. And thank your organization for reprinting it, because yeah. uh, that's, that's also a good job that uh, that you guys have done uh, on that. So it goes around, it comes around, doesn't it? Uh, Hapal, what would you like to add to that? I, I would just like to say fascism, first of all, is not a fashion. It's not that you used yeah. to wear tight trousers and now you wear flare trousers you know, or you got a new hat, it's a very, very serious step for the bourgeoisie to take because it's fraught with all the dangers because it exposes the hollowness of parliamentary cretinism and bourgeois democracy. It shows what the bourgeoisie is capable of doing when it bears its teeth. So you can see it, the bourgeoisie, in its ugliest form, in the form of, form, form, form of fascism. They are forced to resort as Caleb has said, and as Pamdat has said, it is when the bourgeoisie is actually faced with a strong working class movement, accompanied by the decay and stagnation of capitalism. There's unemployment all over the place. There, there are redundancies being declared. Factories are shutting. Money, the source of circulation, disappears for, for, from ev ev every, everywhere. And in those circumstances, what do you do? If you, have a, if you have a docile working class, nothing much will happen. There'll be no need to resort to fascism because everybody's obeying you. And if on the other hand, there's a vibrant working class movement, there's a revolutionary movement which threatens to actually storm the citadels of capital, that is when fascism comes in extremely handy. That, 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 that's, that's where it, it comes. Secondly, fascism is not a single act. It is prepared by a very long process. You talk about immigrants. That's only one of the things. Anti-union, anti-strike strike law, law, laws, um, impediments on free speech, even preventing people from selling literature, which truthfully displays certain histories, whether it's of Zionism or, 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 or any, anybody else. It becomes criminal and you have to fight them one by one at each step because once they accumulate then quantity becomes quality it becomes very difficult to roll roll them back you have to every stage put up a fight and if the fight is not successful in every case at least it awakens a certain section of the section of the proletariat as to what is happening so they're not ignorant it comes over, over a period of time. But one thing that must always be stressed, that the fight against fascism is futile unless it's inseparably connected with the fight against imperialism. It's imperialism that, that produces it. Yes. And I completely agree with both Caleb and Jyoti that this term must not be loosely loosely used. Somebody disagrees with me, mm, I, char I characterize them as fascists then it simply becomes a term of abuse. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I've always applied it to the imperialist bourgeois states in, cre in the midst of an extreme crisis and suffering from decay and stagnation and problems that they cannot solve within, with the help of parliamentary democracy, they resort to fa fascism. There are authoritarian governments all over the place. You can find them in Africa and you can find them, etc. But at the bottom of it, all of them would be supported by various imperialist powers. It's imperialism in decay when it sees its profits threatened, whether at home or abroad, it intervenes. You only have to look at the war being waged by Zionism on, you know, and, and US imperialism and other imperialism. Against against the Palestinian people, you only have to look at the at the war that American and British imperialism has been waging against the the Yemeni people for eight years, up to now through Saudi Arabia as their proxy. But now 
that the Saudis have been beaten by the indomitable and indefatigable um, uh, Yemeni people. They've now, you know, raised the white flag. They, 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 they've given in, you know. They are no longer able to carry on. So imperialism has to take directly. Now you can see, it's not the Saudis who were fighting. It was imperialism using the Saudis as proxies. And when the Yemeni people made the price too much for the Saudis and for the United Arab, Arab uh, Emirates, as they are, as they are, as they are called, here, right? When it was made difficult, they then one by one, first the UAE, then Saudi Arabia, declared that they could not carry on, because in one go, by their attack, with even though they've got backward technology, they don't have F-35 jets, they don't have F-16 jets, they don't have the same kind of missile technology. They knocked out half the oil production of Saudi Arabia, which woke them to the fact that they are not immune from being hit back. And I think the same would be found in the case of the present war waged by the guardians of liberty, Anglo-Saxon imperialism against the Yemeni people. I mean, thinking people who are not communists, whether you have people like Professor John Mearsheimer, whether you have Larry Johnson of the former um, uh, intelligence services in the United States, number of thinking people are saying, there's no way that the Yemenis can be defeated. Of course, they like to call them Houthis. They're not Houthis. Houthi is a tribe. It's a very large tribe. Houthis have been ruling Yemen for 800 years. It's not Houthis. It's an organization called Ansar, Ansar Allah, which actually is lead, leading, leading that struggle. It is obviously a religious organization. But the fact of the matter is, it's raging, it's raging and it has not got a particularly socialist program. All the same, it is resisting imperialism as opposed to parties that claim to be socialist, like the Labour Party, which is actually joining in this genocidal war against the Yemeni people, as indeed they are in the in the in the in the case 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 of, uh, uh, if if you like, uh, the war against against the Palestinian people. So we have got to take all these thing, things into account. Thanks, Rafael. I just want to underline a couple of things uh, you about, there, um, about fascism. But one, the fact that it's needed by the ruling class when the not only that the system is in decay, but the working class movement is strong. It's needed to prevent the rise of a really a strong revolutionary threat. So that's number one thing I think it's very important for people to understand because they constantly, you know, kind of make us jump at shadows while we don't understand what the real threat is, you know. So the ruling class doesn't resort to fascism until it has to. And if the working class isn't putting up any opposition under conditions of bourgeois democracy, no matter how bad things are, well, then it doesn't have to, right? But we do see a kind of process of preparing the ground by the bourgeoisie in case the working class starts to move. So that was something I wanted to bring up. Number two was this thing about, about racism. Um, I take the point that, you know, it, it doesn't have to involve racism, uh, but it seems very clear to me that it almost always will, simply because in the conditions of crisis, when working people are suffering many problems, if you want to pull them away from socialism, one of the things you have to do is find a, a reason for the problems that the working class people uh, have to endure under conditions of capitalist crisis. And of course, the favorite uh, answer to that is it's some section of the population's fault. So Hitler said it was the Jews' fault, right? The Nazis said it was the Jews' fault. Um, but, you know, in all capitalist countries, they have this uh, strong narrative uh, about uh, immigrants, asylum seekers, whatever it might be, how they come here, they take your jobs, they're putting a strain on your services. The reason your schools are falling apart now is not because we're privatizing them and cutting back on uh, the welfare state provisions that we used to make. No, it's because there's too many people trying to use them. And actually the problem is there's too many immigrants. So they're constantly building this narrative in our minds to get us in the mindset for, for scapegoating. And the poorer the area that someone lives in, the more likely they are to feel that this must be true. 
because the propaganda says it all the time and the reality of the life that they live is obviously getting worse. And, you know, they're told from all directions that the reason things are getting worse is because immigrants have come here and ruined our services and taken away our jobs. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to come on to... Um, oh, yes, you were talking about... So, yes, I want to come on to the question of social democracy and how the social democratic parties, the Labour Party uh, in Britain, I guess, I don't know if you have a purely social democratic party. I don't know if you describe the, the Democrats as a social democratic party or not. I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, but anyway, in, 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 uh, in Western Europe, we all have these strong social democratic parties. Uh, and they, they do this thing of pretending to be on the side of the workers. Um, and in particular, say, so for example, right now, we have the Trade Union Congress in Britain uh, is literally this weekend to, to prove its credentials in fighting anti-trade union laws. Uh, it's organized a demonstration in Cheltenham of all places. It's a very um, sort of middle-class area, very privileged jobs. It's sort of the heartland of the establishment really. And it's where GCHQ is. GCHQ is, um, the, the 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 kind of spy center in Britain, where a lot you know a whole load of workers workers very privileged workers sit monitoring the communications of the world and you know doing work of doing doing a big part of the dirty work of British imperialism essentially. And forty years ago, uh, there was a campaign to unionize GCHQ, um, which Margaret Thatcher had set up, and they had initially banned unions, and then eventually it was won. And why have the Trade Union Congress picked this particular struggle of all trade union struggles to kind of put up as, a, as, a, as an example of how we fight for our union rights. It's because essentially they are telling us that that struggle was won when Tony Blair came to power and we got a Labour government instead of a Tory government. And that's exactly what they're trying to do now is tell us, oh, to, to preserve our rights, what we have to do is vote Labour. Right? That's the whole point of this campaign. And what I find um, very interesting about what Hapal was saying earlier is, you know, it's the social democrats who actually create the, the conditions necessary for the working class to accept or for sections of the working class to be brought on board with a, uh, with a, a fascist programme. And Hopal, I wondered if you'd like to talk about that, particularly maybe in the case of Germany, which is the kind of classic case, uh, how that worked out. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah, it's good you bring the question of Germany because we've made general points. I think we must d discuss specific cases and there's no better example of such fascism coming to power with the aid of social democracy than Germany. Than, than Germany. I mean, so fascism came to Italy, it came to Austria, etc. But the most classic case is Germany, and I hope we can spend spend some time. Because one of the things, you see, the bourgeoisie is a very small class. It cannot rule by telling workers, we are the masters of the universe. We are the robber barons of capitalism. We run finance. We run industry. And you either fall in life, line or, you know, this does not work all the time. It is not something that it will accept. So what they have to do is they have to weaken the working class movement. And one of the ways of weakening the working class movement is to divide it, to cause a split in it. Now, social democracy does it by different methods from the methods employed by the fascists. Fascists use force to, do, uh, to achieve their purposes. Social democracy actually, through its influence on the trade, trade unions, causes a split in the in the, in, 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 in the working class movement and thus, thus weakens on every important struggle. If you take Britain, for example, in the last 30 years, the biggest struggle has been that of the mine workers, workers union against pit, pit closures. And it lasted a year. It was a real heroic struggle. And it was only defeated by the combined forces of the, of the state, the Tory party, the Labour party, Trade, trade, trade unions and of course the bourgeois media. That is how it was defeated. It could not have been defeated. Workers actually, under the influence, 
under the malign influence of social democracy, refused to support the miners. They were left alone to fight it. They fought for a year. In the end, it could not be car carried on. And I think one would always salute, salute them. After the general strike of, of, of 1924, it was the largest industrial dispute in Britain, the large, largest struggle. It didn't develop to the point of a general strike, but it was nevertheless a very significant one. So both of them weakened the working class movement and the capitalists find ways of doing that. And most often they use social democracy to be able, able to do that. And when that fails, then they bring in the, uh, the jack, jack, jack boot. They, they bring, bring in the, the fa fascists. But both of them have different methods, but their aim is the same, to weaken the working class movement, to save capitalism. As an as a Austrian social democrat said, we are, capitalism is ill, you know, and we are the nurses to save it from, 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 from dying. They were quite open. There's a book that Otto Barr wrote called The, um, uh, the, the, the Revolution of 1918, because in 1918, in the aftermath of the October Revolution, the Germans established a socialist republic and Karl Liebknecht declared from the from the Reichstag building that this is a socialist republic. And by doing so, he and Rosa Luxemburg, who rather belatedly, you know, who had, especially Rosa Luxemburg, who had actually opposed the Bolsheviks at every t turning point. You know, I don't want to malign social, uh, Rosa Luxemburg. She was a good woman. She had a good heart, but I'm not sure she understood things uh, all, 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 all that well. And they opposed a the, the, uh, the lot of things about the Bolshevik Revolution, calling it a dictatorship. And, you know, it was not democratic. And of course, they discovered too late what, what that bourgeois democracy meant. And they were murdered. And they were murdered by actually the social democrats. Social democrats were the ones who actually allowed the free core, which was a privileged class of officers, German officers, who actually went and murdered them, and what's more, went around to the pubs and bars boasting about their exploits, exploits and they could not be held, 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 held ac ac accountable. So social, I mean, really, you may ask the question, German class, working class movement was so strong, the Communist Party was so strong, how could it be defeated? How could it actually be uh, treated the way it was? There were three reasons for it. After the, the Bolshevik Revolution, imperialism, particularly at that time led by Britain and, 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 and United States, resorted to three methods. First of all, was naked uh, terror. They waged a war of intervention against the, Bol the Bolsheviks. They were able to defeat the Hungarian, Hungarian Revolution and put out the flames everywhere else but they did not succeed with the Bolsheviks. So that was one method. The second one was the use of social democracy. They were actually the purveyors of bourgeois ideology in, 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 the, in, the, in the, in the, in the working class, class movement. And without these, these, these methods, there is no chance of them succeeding. So when, for example, after the failure to suppress the Bolshevik Revolution, there was a short period in which capitalism recovered from what had taken place. This was called the period of stabilization. And of course, American imperialism was very powerful. It was industrially powerful. It was financially powerful. And delegations of trade unions from Britain and other countries as well went to America to learn the lessons of democratic capitalism. And they all came back and declared, it works. Marxism is now out, out, out of date. You know, it's Fordism, it's Taylorism. It's all that important. We don't have to worry, worry about Marxism. And people who had been Marxists earlier, because the Social Democratic Party has its origin in Mar Marxism. It has degenerated so much that eventually they end up 
actually quite directly in the in the camp of fascism we can come come to that but so if that is what happened it's because of the fact that they used terror against the revolutionary movements secondly the social democracy and thirdly of course the strength of american capitalism it was very strong and it was able to give timely help help to the torturing bourgeois governments in europe europe and elsewhere so these were the three reasons for the failure of the revolution in germany and some other 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 places places as well taylor well i think you know i want to echo what harpal just said um and really kind of give a shout out to our german comrades because it is really unfair uh, the way that we've been taught that there's just something inherently inherently fascist about the german people right that that nazism it just kind of came out of german culture germans are just authoritarian and they're just oh they're just nazis deep down and that's that's not the reality the reason that fascism came to germany was because the germans were so progressive because they had built uh, such a huge labor movement and they built such a strong communist party they had the biggest communist party outside of the soviet union um and they had a militant working class and fascism was was imposed on germany to prevent the revolution to prevent uh, the communists from taking power uh and that germany and berlin uh, had long been a center of working class power and struggle uh and also to echo what harpal said is that that nazism and fascism would never have come to germany if it hadn't been for the failure and the betrayal of the working class movement by the social democrats uh that after world war 1 you had this mass uprising where the labor unions and the the social democratic party were basically brought into power the kaiser was forced to step down um and you know victory was almost being handed to the working class and uh yet the social democrats managed to turn that into a defeat uh you know they say that they uh they wrenched defeat from the jaws of victory uh it was it was you know i mean it was unbelievable it was like they had their moment they they had taken power and then they were going to write a new constitution and they said oh yeah we're going to write a capitalist constitution and when rosa luxemburg and karl liebknecht object to it objected to it they killed them um and then you, for a brief time you had the the bavarian soviet republic bavaria declared itself to be a, a socialist country and a marxist government and you had the social democrats mobilizing with the fry corps to put it down and eventually you know it was it was the working class movements misleaders and uh you know revisionist and false leadership that uh that prevented germany from having a socialist revolution and then that that then set the stage for fascism to eventually come in because the left had had their moment and failed um and i think you know when when jody talks about uh how you know the there's going to have to be some xenophobia and that's a big part of it i think that the premise behind fascism is that the pie can only be so big the pie can only be this big um so whenever the pie can only be this big the only way your slice of the pie can get any bigger is you have to cut it into somebody else's and nobody ever thinks that their slice of the pie is is big enough right um and that fascism is really as you know it's 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 rooted in this understanding that that the productive forces need to be reduced and that really comes across in dutt's writing right that 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 the the capitalist system necessitates the destruction of the means of production and the destruction of the productive forces uh and it is you know i mean if you think about fascism in in essence it's the same thing that uh you know is when uh you know when the 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 british empire went to india and burned the looms and and forced the people to import their cloth from britain uh that fascism is uh it, it's the essence of you know when uh during the great depression the american government killed half the cattle in the united states in order to boost the the cost of beef right they just took half the cattle in the country and killed them to double the cost of beef and and bail out the farming industry it's an attempt to save capitalism with destruction and i think that malthusian economics even though it's not directly related to fascism but but robert malthus and his theory of overpopulation the notion that a big section of the working class are what they call useless eaters right that is a big part of it right and so mobilizing the working class to reduce some working class people to be slaves or or to be exterminated uh that is a big big part of fascist economics because you have to do that it's the the idea that to save capitalism we all need to have less um you know in nazi germany one big part of what the nazis did you know we we're always told 
this is particularly infuriating to me. But, you know, in the United States, at least in, in some parts of the United States, it depends where you grew up. Right. You know, when it comes to communism, the way we were taught about communism is communism. Oh, it just failed everywhere it's ever been tried. You'd have to be an idiot to believe in communism. Never had any success. But fascism, we're told, oh, well, you know, Hitler was a very good speaker and that, you know, they, they you know, you have to understand that, you know, communism was such a big threat. And, that, you know, obviously fascism is wrong, but it's an understandable mistake, we're told, you know, you know that's that's the essence of, 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 you know, of how we're taught about it. And and we're always taught that the Nazis saved the German economy. Oh, well, they, you know, they did a lot to improve the German economy. Well, they did it. They did that for two or three years. There was some dramatic economic growth in the early years of Nazi Germany, uh, but they did it with degrowth methods. Um, the main thing that they did is that they got women out of the workforce, um, is that they, you know, they, they basically shamed and drove women out of industrial production. Uh, and, uh, and they, you know, they created a very big marriage bonus for a woman who got married. They had a, a, a government campaign, you know, posters everywhere with a picture of a woman working on an assembly line. This woman is taking a job away from a good German man who has kids to feed, et cetera. And they forced women out of industry. Um, and by doing that, uh, you know, they, they reduced unemployment very significantly. Um, you know, another thing that the Nazis did is they restarted military spending. Um, and, you know, they, they suddenly had, you know, the government spending, you know, millions and millions of dollars uh, to, you know, rebuild the armaments industry. Uh, they also, you know, broke the labor movement and they put the leaders of the Communist Party and the leaders of the Social Democratic Party in concentration camps. And they hired a lot of uh, a lot of uh, working class people to be guards or to be, you know, build the camps and work in the camps. And, th and that also reduced unemployment. And Hitler had promised when he took power, he said, I will eradicate unemployment. Well, he did. He did eradicate unemployment. He did it with heavy handed degrowth methods, driving down, uh, driving down the productive forces. Um, and it only worked for two or three years. And by 1938, 39, the reason Nazi Germany launched World War II was because their, their methods of trying to stabilize the economy with destruction had only gone so far. And if you look at what the Nazis did in the areas they conquered, uh, it was almost a regression into feudalism. Uh, they, they were, I mean, the, the German economy during the Second World War depended on slave labor. Uh, they with all the areas they would go and conquer, uh, they would bring back the people uh, and bring them back to Germany and have them working as slave laborers with with no with no pay, essentially. And they would forcibly depopulate uh, the regions that they took over. And it was it is, you know, when we talk about capitalism, uh, you know, and, and regression into barbarism, fascism in a, in a weird way is an, and it's an attempt on the part of the bourgeoisie to to go back to feudalism, which you can't actually do. But they're trying to some degree with the state to go back to feudalism. And that's why anti-Semitism is a big part of it, because anti-Semitism was a big part of, you know, feudalism in Europe. Right. The idea that the Jew is the money lender, the idea that the Jew is is some foreign foreign person who's not a good part of the Christian kingdom, you know, forcing the Jew to live in a separate ghetto and all of that. And it it's some kind of psychological desire on the part of the bourgeoisie to go back to the stability of feudalism, um, which they can't do because capitalism is a different economic system. But it, it it's an attempt to kind of get the 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 aesthetics or the um, or or the or the economics or the stability of feudalism back. One thing that I point out to a lot of people uh, is that that you know on the left there is this romanticization of of the Dalai Lama in Tibet. Uh, of the the Indian caste system, you know, some of these mystical hippie, you know, elements, they they will romanticize elements of feudalism in Asia. And that was also something that the Nazis and the fascists did. Julius Evola, uh, who was one of the main ideologues of Italian fascism, wrote glowingly about the Dalai Lama, about how amazing Tibet was because there was never any strikes or protests. Everyone just was born right into their place. And the Nazis, their symbol, you know, is a symbol that they got from India. Um, and the Nazis believed they were they were somehow descended from the people of ancient India. And they wrote about the caste system in India, how amazing it was. Everyone's just born into their place. No one's protesting. Everyone just has this. There's this natural order that exists and no one tampers with it. And that's what we need to get back to. And that's very reactionary. That's not progressive. But now it's it's oddly in leftist spaces in, in the West that you get this kind of romanticization of of uh, of feudalism in Asia. So I think that's that's also interesting and worth commenting on. Thanks, Caleb. That was very interesting. Uh, Hapal, do you want to say anything more on the case of Germany? Well, 
I just like to give you a very small quotation from Clara, Clara uh, um, Clara Zatkin, which she says, fascism is the punishment of the proletariat for failing to follow the revolution begun in Russia. You know, and we we continue to pay pay for that 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 failure because can you just imagine what the world politics and the political map, political geography of the world would look if the Germans and couple of other places had, 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 had followed that. And that's precisely why the imperialist countries were very supportive of fascism. Because Lloyd George, who's portrayed as a great liberal, the fact of the matter is he supported Hitler. He said, we must not do anything to disturb the Hitlerites because they are the ones who are protecting against the ravages of Bolshevism. Churchill, who has been repackaged and rebranded as a great anti-fascist fighter, he went in 1928-29 to Italy and addressing Italy, he said, if I was born an Italian, I would have been with you. I, I, I would have vote, voted for you. So all these people were actually in that camp because to them, the most important thing was not what the na na Nazis would, would do, but you know that capitalism must be saved and in the case of Britain, of course, the British Empire must, must be saved. And it's only towards the late 30s that Hitler and the Churchill realized that the Germans were not just after other countries, you know, invading them, Austria, Holland, Poland, etc., but they were after the British Empire. And the po Polish invasion confirmed that. And that's, that's why they went to war. They didn't want to fight against fascism. The only country that fought against fascism in Western Europe was the Soviet Union and in the East, the People's Republic of China, the people of, of Korea, the pe 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 people of Vietnam. But it's a, fascism is a gangster system which suits capitalism very much. It's a lovely quotation that I'd like to give. I don't usually quote um, people like that, but it's very important. I found that. I think it found that book. It's... L Al Capone, uh, Dick Caleb would know much about Al, Al Capone that I don't know. So he, he said, Bolshevism is knock, knocking at the door. We can't afford to let it in. We've got to organize ourselves against it and put our shoulders together and hold fast. We must keep America whole and safe and unspoiled. We must keep the worker away. And this is important. We must, must keep the worker away from red literature and his mind uh, <clears throat> and, 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 and make his mind healthy. Now this appeal of a thief and a gangster is very important. And you can see how important this question of taking the red literature to the workers is. And my party is very small though it is, is very proud to take the red literature to the, to the workers because that is, the key to their liberation, it explains to them, whatever you are suffering, in the final analysis, it's down to capitalism. And unless you can relate your everyday struggle to the long-term aim, the final aim of getting rid of capitalism, you will not be success successful. Even if you te win temporary victories, after a while, you will come back and be fighting the same battles all over again. If you want to put an end to this cycle of life and death that you find in religion, uh, Indian religion, 84,000 lives. And if you don't do good deeds, you go through all those and eventually you get a chance to become a human being and redeem yourself again. Now, we want to get out of that rubbish. We want to get rid of this whole system where we're constantly fighting the same battles, same kind of strikes, because the concessions you win under favorable conditions, when the conditions are not so favorable for the working class movement, they are taken away. This is what happened in Germany. The Weimar Republic was established in the aftermath of the First World War. On paper, it was the finest democracy in, 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 in the world. And their main function, because it was led by the Social Democrats, because between 1918 and 19, uh, to, to, to 28, 
social democrats were part of this government they had the leading figures in police in army uh, 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 and sort of various org organizations and their function was to grant concessions to the working class at some stages in some conditions concessions are necessary they were able to pacify the working class and make them believe this was fine and this was actually accompanied by the strength of american capitalism that's why delegations were sent by the trade unions to learn from america how fordism and how american capitalism were better than the bloodthirsty bolsheviks if you like and you to in order to avoid that and of course the price they paid was they had already paid the price in the first world war then came the second world war these two world wars cost the lives of 100 million people that is the price that was paid for maintaining an outmoded outmoded system but because there was a communist strong communist movement in russia it resulted in the october revolution this was a horrifying result to imperialists that's not why they had fought the war they had fought the war for the redivision of colonies and the and the loot for the redivision of places for investment places where the markets could be found where industry could be established export of capital could take place oh no they get the hated bolsheviks to power and they have never stopped causing trouble from then on up to even now even despite the reverses our movement has suffered in the last 30 40 40, 40, 40 years and the second world war produced a whole so, so, socialist camp so the bourgeoisie is prepared to sacrifice 100 million lives and you have to ask the proletariat is it a price worth paying paying the bourgeoisie says it's worth paying that's fine because by slaughter and by destruction of wealth of humanity they're able to restart the cycle of production and they can actually bring periods of prosperity like in the post war uh, post second world war period there's been tremendous amount of prosperity in the western europe in in japan in in america but if if you ask the working class people a question like that are you prepared every 20 or 30 years to slaughter 100 million people and injure even more and destroy colossal amounts of wealth created by the hands of working working people then i think any thinking worker would say no we're not prepared to in which case we must find a way away from that we must find a different way of or, or organizing society we do not want a gangster system which is approved of by such honorable figures as al, al capone they may be, be the, they may be the leaders of the of the bourgeoisie their thinking might not very sophisticated might coincide with the thinking of monopoly capitalism but ours cannot be the same and we got to uh, f f fight against it and this is what Uh, happened happened in germany they were prepared to tolerate anything as long as they could get rid of the working class movement working class movement was so powerful in 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 in, in germany and it's precisely because it was powerful you know the last election before the fascists came to power was held in 1932 at which election the um social de de democrats lost So, so the Nazis lost lost two million votes. The Social Democrats lost seven hundred thousand votes, and the Communist Party gained another seven hundred thousand, and its total votes were six six million. And it is at that stage that German capitalism finally decided to take the risky step of throwing its weight behind the uh, the, the, the Nazi Party. and the nazi party of course as has been pointed out by both of you before used a mixture of demagogy and repression and demagogy was if you looked at the, the nazi 25 program it includes such wonderful things as you know no unearned profits no usury no 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 money on 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 interest etc etc which of course duped the petty bourgeois which duped the demoralized sections of the work, working class and of course it had the bourgeoisie on its side a combination of these three forces and of course the collaboration of the social democrats 
with what was taking place, always in the name of parliamentary democracy, because they, to them the only instrument for change was parliament. And only by voting, only through the ballot box, and only by votes in parliament could anything forward be achieved, achieved for the working class. The other side wasn't playing by, the, by, this, by this, this rule. And that's really what, what, what happened. And when people say the communists were sectarian, they didn't want to collaborate with the, with, with the social democrats. That is a lie spread by the Trotskyites and by their, of course, patrons among the, the bourgeoisie. The fact of the matter is the Communist Party made a lot of appeals to the Social Democratic Party to collaborate and prevent the rise of fascism. Had Social Democratic and Communist forces been united, there's no way the, social, the fascists could have come, come to power. No, it's the Social Democrats who were so sectarian against the Communist Party, and they were sectarian not for the reasons of just being sectarian, because they wanted to safeguard capitalism. They didn't want Bolshevism to invade Germany. They were anti-Bolshevik, they were anti-communist, so that they would collaborate. And at every stage, even after Hitler had been installed as a chancellor of, of Germany, they promised to work as a loyal opposition in parliament. And they endorsed Hitler because he had come to power lawfully. Although the last election that was held by, by, by the Hitlerites was after Hitler had been installed quite undemocratically as a chancellor by, by, by Hindenburg. They uh, 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 said, well, he's come to power by parliamentary law, lawful methods. And even after they, the fascists had started suppressing the trade unions, their idea was to actually be a loyal, loyal opposition. But of course, Hitlerites didn't respect that. When they had consolidated themselves, they marched all the social democrats along with others into jail and said, that's where you belong. The leader of the Hitlerite labor front called Dr. Ley, he said, you may profess loyalty to Hitler, but you belong there. And they were sent to the German fascist dungeons all, all the same. They were not rewarded, you know, they, they, they were treated also badly, but that didn't somehow affect them. They continued to, 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 to actually espouse fascism. One of them even wrote a letter to the second international, can you believe it? That all these rumors that you are spreading about what the German fascists are doing are totally wrong and you must, you must, you must stop, stop that. And so that is really, the, the history that is what has brought um, the, that that is what brought uh, the fa fa fascist fascist power in Germany. The social democrats have a lot to answer. When our party fights against social democrats, and it has done so consistently ever since its foundation twenty years ago, and before that, people who are involved in the foundation of that party have been fighting against it, and we've always been told we are sectarians. Yes. We are sectarians against those who serve the bourgeoisie. We don't mind being sectarians. The worst sectarians are those who betray the interests of the working class and join the other side, join the bourgeoisie. To me, they are the sectarians and because they are trying to split the working class movement, they're trying to delude it into believing that parliamentary cretinism is the answer to our problems. Thanks, Rafal. There was a couple of points that I wanted to underline from what you just said before I move on. Uh, to our next kind of um, question. And that's really what you just finished with there, This the importance of understanding that it's social democracy, the Labour Party in Britain, which splits the working class movement by promoting illusions in bourgeois democracy, by keeping workers away from the understanding that there's no way out of economic crisis, no way out of imperialist war without socialism. And um, just by way of highlighting how far the mighty can fall once they go down this road, I just want to read you a little quote from uh, Karl Kautsky, who, before the outbreak of World War One, was considered the, the kind of natural inheritor of Marx and Engels, or successor to Marx and Engels. He was uh, seen as the theoretical leader not only of German socialism, but because German socialism led the world of world socialism. And uh, at the time of... Um, 
I'm just checking. Yeah, the time that um, Hitler was put into power, Kautsky actually said, the dictatorship has the mass of the population behind it. So this is, you know, this is the way what Hopal was just talking about, that the leaders of German social democracy um, having essentially, you know, committed themselves to um, pulling the wool over the eyes of the workers, to prettifying uh, bourgeois democracy, anything that's done under the name of bourgeois democracy is sanctified by them with their, you know, they bring out their holy water. Yes, yes, well, it was, it's a democratic process, you know, and they are the ones who are mainly responsible for creating this idea in people's minds that there's some abstract thing called democracy and democratic processes, which are kind of just sacrosanct and, ha and removing from workers' understanding the fact that there's a class content to all, all democracy and that democracy is also dictatorship simultaneously. And you have to understand which class has democracy and which class is, is running the dictatorship. And um, you know, the job of the social democrats very much was was to hide that from people. So, and the other thing I wanted to just pull out was that um, when Mosley uh, in Britain, Oswald Mosley founded a party called the British Union of Fascists, um, it had it at its formation it was joined by one Tory MP and six Labour MPs. Six came from the Labour Party because. They fit together quite naturally, actually, in terms of their ideology and their outlook. So the next question I really wanted to bring up was um, the question of a post-World War II situation. Um, because we've talked a bit about how, um, you know, fascism is only necessary when you have a strong working class movement. Now, it seems to me that in post-war Europe, the massive concessions that were made to the working class in Western imperialist countries, where imperialism was in dire trouble, actually, and, you know, faced a very real threat of being totally extinguished in Western Europe. Um, and it was propped up by two things. One was American money, again, because US imperialism was still strong. And the other thing was the huge concessions it made to the working class. And with, again, with the aid of social democracy, the, the working class movement in, the, in Western Europe, which had been huge, very strong, uh, very much pushing for socialism at that time in 1945, was basically bought off. And so fascism wasn't needed in the imperialist countries. But very much if you look around the world, if you look at countries which were achieving liberation from imperialism, um, in many of them what you see is this post-war kind of export of fascist methods to put down strong anti-imperialist and socialist movements in countries which are you know, showing signs of becoming really independent, not just nominally independent from imperialism. Um, and I wondered, um, Harpal, maybe if you wanted to talk a bit about that, would you, can we call that fascism? Because it looks a lot like it. Well, well first of all, um, I, I just like to uh, say that Stalin for, uh, said something for which he's denounced regularly by the en enemies of socialism, by Trotskyites, revisionists, etc. He said, social democracy is the moderate wing of fascism. Now, it's perfectly clear to me, knowing the history of fascism and the, especially German fascism, the difference between the social democrats was they were moderate. They split the working class by persuasion, by having a benign, malign influence on the, on the working class and controlling it in the interests of capital, whereas the fascists, of course, do it by violent means. But what happens in the, after the Second World War is, as Jyoti has rightly said, Capitalism made a lot of concessions. And these concessions were made on the understanding that if these concessions were not made, the Soviet Socialist uh, Republic, which had actually defeated almost single-handedly the onslaught of, of, of na na Nazism and emerged victorious, and with a victorious camp of socialist countries, which were liberated through the Red Army, if it didn't give concessions, this actually there was no guarantee at that time because there was a ferment in the working class movement, even in countries like, like Britain. The workers were not going to come back to conditions which they had left before they went into the bad battle of the, of the Second World, World, World War uh, during 39 and, and, and 45. So if these concessions were not made, who was to prevent the red flag moving further west in, into countries particularly France and Italy, 
which had strong communist parties. The communist party in France had over a million members. The Italian communist party had more than two million members. And of course, what gutted them was not only these concessions, which of course did have some effect, but also soon after that, they were joined by Khrushchevite revisionists who attacked Stalin after the 20th Party Congress and disoriented and disorganized the, 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 the work, working class movement. And so, and revisionism is really a form of social democracy, if you like, because that's what social democracy was. It was a revisionist of the Marxist doctrine, first adopted by, by the Germans and their followers. But then, of course, when Khrushchev came on the scene, it acquired a much more potent force because it was coming from a powerful Soviet state, the first workers state, the first state to build socialism, the land of Soviets, the land of Lenin and Stalin, for which people had a lot of respect. And if the general secretary of the party, which was still called the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and Bolsheviks, was saying Stalin was a criminal, who were these minor figures who disagree uh, uh, w w w with that formulation? And it did tremendous lot of harm to the working class movement. And it's only now that with the help of various small groups like ourselves, the movement is beginning to recover and people are beginning to learn. In the former Soviet Union, people are increasingly going around, understanding what Stalin's Soviet Union was, was about, and the revisionists do not have much traction. The Communist Party of the Russian Federation has to honor Stalin, has to honor the building of so socialism. It can no, no, lo no longer be ignored. And I have to say that over the question of the war waged by NATO against uh, Russia, capitalist Russia, admittedly, uh, through using Ukrainian people as, as, as cannon fodder and as proxy, the Communist Party of the, Federa of the, of the, uh, of the Russian Federation has a better position on that than many so-called left-wing co co communists who are just saying it's just an inter-imperialist war. Fire on both your houses. We are not siding with anything. And our party is very proud to say we think that our side has a legitimate choice to make and we choose the Russian side for the defeat of NATO imperialism because it would not lead to socialism directly, but it will prepare the ground by weakening NATO imperialism for the development of a work, working class class movement. Thanks, Rupal. Caleb. Well, I, I guess I'll just add that um, when you talk about the export of fascist methods after World War II, you know, after World War II, we had the great, you know, economic expansion. The post World War II economic expansion was the greatest episode of growth in you know human history. There's never been that much economic growth. You know, the capitalist system had destroyed so much during the war. Um, and in a lot of developing countries, uh, to, to hold off the threat of communist revolution, uh, you had the United States propping up these kind of military governments that engaged in very ruthless, heavy handed repression of uh, the working class movement and of communists. Um, and, you know, Indonesia is a great example of that. You know, the, the coup in Indonesia, you know, at least half a million people killed. Uh, it, turned, it started out as a heavy-handed crackdown on communists. It ended up being just a, an ethnic genocide against the, the Chinese, you know, ethnically Chinese communities in Indonesia. Uh, there's many examples of this, but this was very expensive. Uh, but the bourgeoisie was willing to tolerate it um, because they were threatened by communist revolution. And a lot of these, you know, military regimes that they propped up in various places. Uh, in order to stay in power, they had to hand out the goods, not to the working class, but to the middle class, but to, you know, they had to bribe a section of the military or autocracy and a section of the, uh, a section of the middle class to be loyal to the regime while they brutally put down uh, the working class movement. Park Chung-hee is an example of that in South Korea, his regime, and you know, they say he built South Korea. He did, but he also murdered, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of revolutionary working class people in South Korea, but he did, you know, develop South Korea's economy and build, build, build a lot of, you know, and that that a lot of these kind of, you know, you know, militaristic authoritarian regimes were tolerated by the ruling class uh, and the imperialists as a barrier against communism. And then the tide started shifting. And in the 1980s and especially in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union, the ruling class themselves started removing these various regimes because they were a barrier to austerity. 
uh, because their system needed austerity in order to stabilize itself. And so we saw in the 1990s, many of the military regimes and authoritarian states that had engaged in this heavy handed repression in South America uh, being removed by the U.S. government because they were a barrier to austerity. And George Soros and the Open Society Institute and the Color Revolutions and a lot of the liberal apparatus was about removing, you know, these regimes because they wanted all out austerity and that it's very expensive to have uh, an authoritarian military state because if you're going to have an authoritarian military state, somebody's got to be profiting from it. The only way people will tolerate that level of control and suppression of their liberties is they have to be gaining economically and that, that these military regimes, you know, kind of required, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that the goods be handed out and that there be, you know, there'd be a section of the population whose loyalty was bought. Um, and so the 1990s was defined by, you know, the, the open society and the democratization of so many of these countries. But what that meant was creating a government that was so weak, it would just roll over and accept uh, impoverishment at the hands of the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and and it, it, it's kind of a weird contradiction on the part of the ruling class. On the one hand, they they want to save their system, you know, with austerity. On the other hand, they want to, you know, crush communist revolution at all at all costs. Um, but but that can be expensive. And we see, you know, the drive for austerity, the drive to make the working class pay for the crisis that the, the capitalists have created. That is kind of the, the essence of what the ruling class is trying to do at all times, to make us pay for the crisis that their system has created, to make us carry the cost of the failures of their system. How do they do that and what methods do they use? Uh, it takes on different forms in different times. Thanks, Caleb. Papal, did you want to add anything on this question of exporting fascism? Well, imperialism is a world system and it's determined to maintain its dominance and it will do so by all means and of course in countries where the movement is strong it will always resort to force and hence the examples that that uh, Caleb has given Indonesia is a, is a perfectly good example nearer home to him is, is Chile of course that's precisely what happened the socialist movement was strong but you know there were elements in, 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 in Chile who had illusions in the inviolability of the Chilean constitution. And Allende, who was a very good man, suffered from that illusion and paid for it with, with his own life and thousands of people were mur murdered. And that war criminal who was responsible um, for uh, uh, helping shape American policy in Chile as in, 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 in Indochina, Henry Kissinger, who's just died at the age of 100, much loaded by the bourgeoisie as being a brilliant statesman and all the rest of it. He was actually a fascist butcher as far as I'm concerned. And no, there was not an ounce of human decency in that, that, that person. That's why he was so handsomely rewarded. You know, he was a immigrant of Jewish origin from, from Germany, and he died with, I don't know how many million, million, million pounds, as servants of imperialism always money to do, like Tony Blair has got, uh, you know, several hundred million, million. He came from a relatively modest, modest background. And of course, they suddenly discover what's the way of making money, and that is serve imperialism. And they're prepared to commit genocide everywhere like along with them, George Bush, T Tony Blair, everywhere applauded wherever the American troops went and sent British troops, whether, whether it was in Iraq, whether it was in Afghanistan, and whether it was a question of uh, attacking Libya, they all did, did, did these, these, these dirty things uh, un undoubtedly. And I'm sure you're coming to the probably end of our session and I'd just like to summarize uh, why the German working class uh, revolution and in some other countries did not materialize. One was the strangling of the 1918 revolution by the Social Democratic uh, Party and the trade unions that it, it, it controlled. Secondly, the support by social democracy and the trade unions in Germany uh, for the su successive emergency dictatorship regimes of Severing and 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 and, and Mueller, Mueller and all the rest of it, and thirdly, 
rejection by the Social Democratic Party and the trade unions of a united working class front against um, fa fa fascism. And finally, the refusal by the, um, to re the refusal by them to resist Hitler rights on Hitler's acces accession to power. Because even when he came to power, they said he's come to power by parliamentary means. He's a legitimate leader. Jyoti's given you the quotation from, from uh, uh, Kautsky. But the same thing happened with, with Britain. The Daily Herald, which was the newspaper of the trade, British trade unions and the Labour Party, said, yes, Nazis are not socialists of our type, as though your type is better than theirs. But all the same, they have a program which will not help the land, big landlords, it will not help the big, big, big capitalists. Fenner Brockway, bless his soul, you know, who was the left winger in the social democratic circles. He was from the Independent Labour Party, who was against the Soviet Union, against Stalin. He was quite happy with the Mosleyites, who were forming a, a British. Uh, it, 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 eventually, it became the un, Union of uh, British Union of, fa of, of Fascists, and number of people supported the Mosleyites in for, 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 forming that party. So there is the tendency to go towards that because anything except the devilish Bolsheviks and the communists, that's what must be prevented because that would mean the end of imperialist profits and that would mean the end of the crumbs that fall from the imperialist table to help maintain the lifestyle and the cozy lives of Labor, labor aristocracy, whom they represent, apart from in, in, in imperialism, and one of the reasons that socialism and that fascism did not come to Britain is there was really never any need for it. Since the suppression of the Chartist movement in the mid nineteenth century, British capitalism, because of the dominance of the world market, because of its industrial monopoly, it was the only town in the country. In fact, Britain was the town, if you like. They were able to make concessions. The working class movement simply died down. And between that and the formation of the independent Labour Party, 60 years later, there was no socialist movement. And the working class basically were represented by the Liberal Party, party if, 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 if you like. And that is really the problem. And that is why there has been no fascism. And that is also the problem. There hasn't been movement fast enough in the direct, direct direction of socialism. In America, American capitalism was so prosperous and strong. There is not even a social democratic party. Now, the, the revisionists in America and various other people try to make out as, a, as the democratic party is a social democratic party of the old type is what trying to bring benefits to the working class. Nothing of the kind. They're as bloodthirsty, if not more so, than the Republican Party. And ordinary workers in America understand that, even if the cheerleaders in the so-called left-wing movement do not, do, do not under, under, understand that. That's precisely why you find today that Biden, the Democratic administration, is even more criminally involved in foreign war, wars than were the previous administrations of George W. Bush and Trump. I mean, Trump, of course, was very pro-Israeli. Pro Trump was very anti-China. But all the same, he did things which disturbed imperialism, which actually served to begin the disintegration of that. That's why the whole of the imperialist press and the establishment today is so set upon making sure that they can't probably defeat um, Trump if the election is between Biden and, and Trump. That's a, that's a given. So they're trying to prevent him somehow from standing, trying to disqualify him. I'm not asking you to declare your positions. I'm not asking you to support Trump. But that will explain why the whole establishment is so anti-Trump. Anti because they have got a sense which is far keener than the average untutored working class person. They know their class interest and they know which side to actually opt for. And that's why they're opting for anybody in the establishment than Trump, if you like.
Thanks, Carl. I just wanted to underline that point that wherever you see fascism in action, you know that behind it is the power of monopoly capital. It's monopoly capital that funds it, that brings it to power, that backs it up with the power of its media and its and its finances, and it does it in the interest of retaining its overall control of the economy, of the resources, uh, and of the the labour of the people, and of preventing socialist movements from from taking countries out of the sphere of its orbit. Uh, I just tell me, I know we've been going a little while. Caleb, do you have five more minutes? I had one more question to bring up if we've got time. Okay, yeah, go ahead, five more minutes. Just a quick one. It was really uh, this question of, of fascization that people talk about today, this uh, the kind of what, what we're seeing is, you know, as the crisis is deepening, as the drive to war is accelerating, and we're really kind of well into you know the early stages of world war three now i think it has to be said and we can see the flames of war you know spreading uh you know day by day um there are measures coming in which look like they're preparing the groundwork for rising class struggle you know we're getting measures to stop our freedom of speech measures to stop our freedom of assembly measures to stop our freedom of expression in the written form as well measures um to stop trade unions uh, from taking meaningful action in Britain. You know, the anti-trade union laws in, in our country go back, you know, several decades really to the defeat of the miners. And, you know, they get steadily worse. The, the, the ability of workers to organize meaningfully against the system are more and more sort of confined. And some people identify this as a kind of a creep towards fascism. Um, and I wondered what was what would what, what your views were on that both of you. Uh, Caleb. Well, I think this is just the capitalist system breaking down um, and that they are trying to make the workers pay for the crisis that they created. Um, and I don't think we should we should see it necessarily uh, as fascism. Um, you know, I mean, we should understand that fascism is what they will have to go to uh, when the crisis intensifies, um, you know, in order to stabilize the economy with heavy handed degrowth. But I think that what you're describing is is that's the the feeling of the entire work uh, the entire ruling class they want you know they're unified around this program of making the workers pay of cracking down on people's civil liberties and freedom of speech um, you know and um, you know any division in the ruling class should be utilized but I think that that a lot of what people describe as creeping fascism or whatever is really just uh, the agenda of the entire bourgeoisie uh, trying to make the workers pay for the crisis they created. Papa. Uh, I'd like to just make one point. My party, the Communist Party of Great Britain, Great Britain Marxist-Leninist, is a very small party. The fact that it's being targeted simply means it actually is daringly able to speak the truth. And truth is the enemy of the lies told by the bourgeoisie and its servants in the working class movement, the social democrats. They can't tolerate, they can't answer us, they can't enter into an argument with us. They can't invite one of us to a TV show and say, can you discuss it? They just keep on saying, Marxism is dead. Well, if it's so dead, there's no need for you to drum up. You know, we don't talk of dead people all the time, do we? You know, whoever they are. So if it's dead, I mean, I have given this example, probably bore you. If somebody comes along to say to you, Napoleon is dead, what would you think? You think the man was a lunatic? The woman was a lunatic, but we know Napoleon died two two hundred years ago. What's the what's what's there to say about that? If Marxism is dead, why has the bourgeoisie got to worry about it? It's not dead. It's a living ideology. It is the ideology of the working class, and as Marx pointed out, it can no more be squashed. It can no more be suppressed than can the working class. And if the working class is spread suppressed there is no bourgeoisie, which is the very condition of the existence of the bourgeoisie, i.e. the working class that works and produces surplus profits and surplus value for them. Marxism is well and alive. Movements go into decline. It's not the first movement to go into decline, but it will rise again like, like Phoenix, uh, you know, and it, 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 it would rise again because life's conditions forced working people to come towards communism. Communism is something 
which resonates working people in the right, right conditions. So all the conditions of prosperity and special conditions produced in the aftermath of the Second World War with the combination of social democracy, Christian white revisionism are fast dwindling. And therefore, it's due, the communists in every country, no matter how small they are, duty bound to bring the knowledge of Marxism to the working class, because that is the key to their, their liberation. Beautiful. I think we can leave it there. All right.